The French, too, had a plan, simple and to the point. Whatever the circumstances, it is the Commander-in-Chief's intention to advance. All forces united to the attack of the German armies. Whatever the circumstance, the French army would advance. Whatever the circumstance, in full strength. Whatever the circumstances, through the lost provinces of Alsace and Lorraine on to the Rhine. Whatever the circumstance, the pride of France would march on. The French infantry would march still dressed in the red uniforms of 50 years before. Amid the uniforms of old France was a touch of Africa. Zouaves from Algeria and Morocco. And the famous Foreign Legion. The cavalry too would advance, still wearing uniforms worn at Waterloo, but eager to charge and slash the German enemy. With uniforms drawn from history and ideas drawn from fiction, the army was up to date in one respect. It had the finest field gun in the world, the 75 millimeter. Flexible and mobile, it was capable of firing 25 rounds per minute. And the French army had them in great numbers. Europe's two greatest powers were set to collide. The French War Plan 17 was first put to the test on 6 August, when General Bonneau's 7th Corps advanced into the green mountains of Upper Alsace. The French army was able to retake Mulhausen, and for the first time in 44 years, it once again became Mulhouse. Bonneau was soon obliged by German troops from Strasbourg to retire in disorder and Mulhouse was once again Mulhausen. The French retreated in such a haste that we actually had to run after them. At first we found heaps of French army blankets, which the soldiers had thrown away. Then we found French greatcoats. Then we found French knapsacks. Then we found French belts with ammunition pouches full of cartridges. And finally, in barns hidden, or sitting just on the roadside, the exhausted French soldiers. On 14 August, Joffre ordered the army of Alsace under General Pau to try again. Once again, Mulhausen became a French city, and in a matter of hours reverted back to its German name. As threats to the Allied left and center developed, Joffre had to withdraw Pau's formations for use elsewhere along the front. Mulhausen would remain in German hands for the foreseeable future. These opening moves left the French with only a small corner of Alsace in the eastern foothills of the Vosges. The principal thrust into Lorraine by Dubai's first army and to Cassano's second army also began on 14 August. The French advanced as liberators and not conquerors. The man in charge of the Kaiser's vast army was a man of unsteady nerves. General von Moltke was a cultured, thoughtful, reasonable man, but he was also a sick one, an uncertain man. Now, as the French were about to advance once again into Alsace and to launch a grand all-out offensive into Lorraine, von Moltke's indecisions grew upon him. The ambitions of other generals also came into play. When Crown Prince Rupert of Bavaria proposed a counterattack by his 6th Army and von Heringen's 7th Army, Moltke, seduced by the prospect of enveloping both French flanks, let them proceed. The subsequent actions at Sarrebourg and Morange on 29 August rapidly revealed that for the French infantry, offensive spirit would not by itself triumph over modern artillery and machine guns. Having vastly underestimated the extent to which the Germans would use reservists, and still unaware of the real width of the German drive through Belgium, Joff misjudged the strength of the German center. Ordered to advance northeast into the Ardennes, Rutherie's 3rd Army and Delandre de Carry's 4th Army blundered into German forces around Neufchâteau and Virton on 21-22 August and were bloodily repulsed. 
we were shot down like rabbits. Because for them it was a real target, because we had red trousers and they were down in the hole eventually. Then we had to retreat, of course. We lie down for a certain while, try to make some holes. And after that, when we could do nothing, we had to retreat back. If the French plan seemed to be thrown into a cocktail, Moltke's overall handling of German operations was even less certain than that of the French. On 17 August, he made a misguided effort to improve the coordination of the German right wing, placing Kluck under the orders of the more cautious Bulow. By the 19th, the true scale of German strength and movement began to dawn upon La Rézac, the French 5th Army commander. As he approached the Sambre and Meuse between Charleroi and Givet, he found the German 2nd and 3rd Armies advancing towards him from the north and east through Belgium. Larizac felt he must act immediately to avert disaster. <laughs> 